Shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Hey guys, Spirit of the Lie here. In this overview, we're going to be taking a deep look at the Romans. Now, Romans are in an interesting spot at the moment. Typically, high win rate civilizations are among the most popular, as players overall prefer to play stronger civs. And yet despite their excellent performance on the latter since release, Romans are consistently among the least often played. The term hidden gem I think could apply here, and in this video we're going to cover their bonuses, unique units, and tech tree to see how it all fits together. Let's check them out. Starting with their team bonus, Romans and their allies have reduced minimum range on their scorpions, dropping that from 2 tiles to 1. Of course, they're still incredibly vulnerable to cavalry or eagle warriors that manage to close the distance, given they have no melee armor. And instead, I've actually found this most often comes into play against a large mass of archers or cavalry archers. Players will sometimes try to get too close to scorpions for them to fire, but having less minimum range means there's almost always still an enemy unit far enough away to target, making that particular tactic surprisingly ineffective against Romans or their allies. Moving on to their civ bonuses, the first is that Roman villagers gather, build, and repair 5% faster. Admittedly, it's not the most creative bonus in the world, but completely on its own, I'd argue makes Romans a very flexible civilization, opening up just about any strategy in the early game. By the time you click up to Feudal Age, for example, you're functionally one villager ahead, giving you an extra 40 to 50 resources while aging up compared to many other civilizations doing the exact same build. It then scales with your economy, so that by the late game having 120 villagers, for example, it's like having six more that are not only free, but don't take up pop space. In case you're wondering, the devs even remember to scale how fast farms generate food, so the cap on late game farmers is bumped up proportionally. Now while extra resources are the obvious benefit here, building speed can also help in many small ways, meaning any houses, that first stable in feudal age, early walls, and even castle drops are all going to be just a bit faster. Better repair speed can also come in clutch when someone's trying to tread down one of your castles, and in a lot of ways this bonus is not dissimilar to the effect given to villagers from playing the game with a 105% handicap. In fact, one could argue it's the most flexible equal bonus in the game, as it starts to help immediately with collecting sheep and is still helping at the 2 hour mark if the game goes that long, impacting all the resources you're gathering with villagers. Moving on, their next bonus is that the galley line and Droman have an extra of each type of armor. Armor usually isn't that big of a deal on naval units thanks to a lot of unblockable bonus damage. And for context means in a feudal galley battle, Romans take 13 instead of 12 shots, basically working as a tiebreaker. In Castle Age though, you can combine this with unique tech, and at that point the two together start to be a little more impressive, hitting the high water mark of the Roman navy. In Imperial Age they lack Bracer, putting them eventually behind a good civilization like Saracens for example, though you do also have to factor in your faster working villagers. The Droman on the other hand is quite a bit more squishy than the Galleon to begin with, though an extra one armor means it takes one more shot from Galleons. While they aren't unique to the Romans, they're being buffed in the patch coming out this month. And just to give a sense of what they offer, against buildings they have one less range than a cannon galleon, which could potentially bite you against Tudin castles for example. They also deal less bonus damage than cannon galleons to buildings as well, but fire 25% faster, making them actually very comparable to non-elite cannons. Unlike cannons though, they can also hold their own against galleons one on one, though they are considerably more expensive. The point isn't that they'll save you against a superior fleet, but considering they're slightly cheaper than cannon galleons, don't need an elite upgrade, don't require chemistry, fire faster, and move faster, they feel quite a bit more flexible in every major way, with the trade-off of having slightly less range. Next up, their third bonus is really what makes Romans an infantry civilization, and is that their infantry receive double the effect from blacksmith armor upgrades, while notably only having the first two techs available. To give a bit of context in Feudal Age, this lets them take 50% more shots from archers, and of course a little extra from enemy men-at-arms or scouts as well. This alone makes a men-at-arms opening a very popular way to play Romans, keeping your opponent focused on trying to save their buildings and villagers while you safely expand your economy back home. 
With equal resources, your Roman men-at-arms should win against an equal number of enemy men-at-arms and even a balanced number of scouts, making them hard to fight head-to-head, -head, and even archer sieves can have trouble with them since they arrive quite early. Men-at-arms can then be combined with either towers to apply more pressure on things like woodlines, or combined with other counter units like skirmishers or spears. And remember, Roman spearmen are also getting the extra effect from armor. Following up in Castle Age, picking up the second armor upgrade then gives Roman longswords 5 melee and pierce armor, compared to the usual 3. This doubles their usual resistance to crossbows, town centers, and skirmishers, making them incredibly annoying to deal with. They do lack supplies, so they're not necessarily getting as much cost efficiency in melee as you might expect against something like knights, for example, losing with equal resources. But between pikemen also having plus 4 plus 4 armor, or monks, you can still usually come up with an answer to mass knights. Instead, cavalry archers and large numbers of crossbows are probably the biggest threats at that point, and that's where their next bonus is going to come in. Just to finish up on this one first though, in Imperial Age they actually end up losing a bit of their edge compared to other infantry, as their missing techs start to add up. Somewhat making up for that is their unique legionary upgrade, which we'll break down in a moment, but the main idea here is that their armor bonus peaks in Castle Age, with longswords taking 2 damage from crossbows and town center fire. One thing that shouldn't be lost here is that pikemen are also benefiting, though they still take unblockable bonus damage from skirmishers and crossbows, making the effect of high armor not quite as noticeable as it is for longswords. I did mention a potential weakness to crossbows and cavalry archers though, which leaves Romans in need of a good support unit against those, especially as they hit a critical mass. And that's where their final sit bonus comes in, giving Roman scorpions a 60% gold cost reduction, as well as benefiting from the tech ballistics. While 60% is a huge discount, saving 45 gold per unit, I actually think the ballistics effect can be just as impactful, since scorpions otherwise have virtually no chance of hitting moving targets. While you can use this bonus to mass a ton of scorpions, and that can be tempting against archer sieves, that also leaves you vulnerable to mangonels and later onagers or bombard cannons. Keep in mind, even two or three well-positioned defensive scorpions can prevent a lot of damage by simply turning away an enemy raid. With ballistics, they can't even really be dodged like Manganel shots, as their projectile moves almost twice as fast by default and can then track moving targets. While they're still quite weak to cavalry, scorpions are clearly intended to address the Roman infantry's general weakness to range and lack of mobility, playing a similar role to skirmishers, but with considerably more damage output. So that's the Romans' bonuses, and while the 5% villager boost means you could reasonably play them as a cavalry or archer into crossbow civilization, as is your preference, there's also a lot of incentive here to lean into infantry and scorpions if you're open to a more non-standard playstyle. Now having already alluded to one of them, let's switch now to take a look at their unique units in more depth. We'll start with the legionary, which for Romans replaces both the two-handed swordsman and the champion. Side by side with the champion, their stats are actually pretty similar, with just a couple of small differences like more armor and HP, though this comparison hides the legionary's real advantages. First, their upgrade cost is cheaper and faster to research, considering it's only one upgrade instead of two, and this is on top of not needing the final armor upgrade or gambesons to end with comparable armor. Those savings together partly offset the cost of their Imperial Age unique tech, Commuta Tenseis, after which they gain an extra plus 5 charge attack, letting them get out some extra damage in the first few seconds of any fight. One of the other extra advantages of the Legionary is it has bonus damage against all infantry units, on top of the champion's regular bonus against eagles and buildings. That allows them to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with even top-tier champions. Keep in mind this isn't even their final form though, as they also benefit from the Romans' unique unit at the castle, the Centurion, with the two units having one of the most symbiotic relationships in the game. Just like the Legionary, the Centurion is quite strong on its own, with pretty similar stats to the Knight in Castle Age, and basically the same stats as a generic Paladin after their elite upgrade, though also having that plus 5 charge attack thrown in by the earlier mentioned unique tech. They are slightly more expensive than the Knight line at 15 more food and 10 more gold each, but are considerably cheaper and faster to upgrade than going Cavalier into Paladin. So calling them more expensive than Paladins is only really true when comparing large numbers of them. Of course, you have the bottleneck of needing castles as the main drawback that makes it tricky to mass them compared to Knights or Paladins, but the point is they're actually a functional heavy cavalry unit in the late game completely on their own. Their unique effect though, and the major reason to make at least a few of them in many games, is to power up nearby legionaries, giving them a movement and attack speed boost when within 10 or 12 tiles. 
That makes them harder, better, faster, and stronger than just about any infantry they encounter, beating even Japanese champions with supplies, which also works particularly well considering how the two units protect each other's weaknesses. Legionaries excel against infantry like halberdiers, while the Centurion gives the mobility to deal with things like siege that legionaries have trouble chasing down on their own. You can't help but feel romantic about how much better the two units are together than apart. One thing I should note is it doesn't matter how many Centurions you have, 10 nearby give the same aura effect as one, so don't feel like you need to mass or even fully upgrade them if your main focus is infantry. Throw in some scorpions against archers and something anti-building like siege ram or trebuchet and you have the classic Roman death ball on closed maps with a lot of synergy between those unit types. With the unique units out of the way though, now let's quickly look at their unique techs at the castle, doing even more to beef up your core army. The first is ballistas, letting your scorpions fire 33% faster as well as giving plus two attack to the galley line. This cements Romans as having among if not the best scorpions in the game. They're not as fast as Mongols or sturdy as Celts, but have better damage output than Khmer, Chinese, or Celts against a large group. And don't forget, they're also massively discounted while also being able to track moving targets. As for the galley line effect, the plus two attack combined with one more armor means even with missing bracer, they're still about 15% more effective against other galleons. It's not quite as impactful as the Saracen's 25% faster firing, for example, but is a notable improvement in late game water battles against more generic civilizations. Their other unique tech, Kamita Tenseis, we already saw, with its effect on both legionaries and centurions gaining a small charge attack, and it also does the same thing for the knight line as well. Another effect it has is to let those units also train 50% faster. Now I don't want to oversell the effect of a one time plus 5 attack at the start of combat, which often won't technically change how many attacks you need to defeat an enemy unit, but even for the faster creation time alone, it's probably worth picking up eventually if you have the gold. Certainly in a team game I would strongly consider it, especially if you're massing centurions, though in 1v1 games it's a trickier call as it has the same gold cost as 40 legionaries, pricing it right on the edge of where it may not be worth it. So that's the unique units and techs, and while there's a clear direction you're pushed in for your late game army composition with two synergizing unique units and the scorpion, now let's step back and take a broader look at their tech tree, starting with the archers. Here things get up to a nice start with 5% more resources collected, that is until the crossbow line basically fizzles out with no arbalester, thumbring, or bracer. Those missing techs also majorly hold back the cavalry archer and leave you with decent but not great skirmishers. I don't mind an archer opening for Romans in theory, but after feudal age the archery range is pretty underwhelming, worth maybe a C. Next up, for infantry, you have a great opening with double the effect of armor upgrades, making Romans one of the most viable infantry sieves in the early to mid game. Even with a handful of missing techs, including supplies, the swordsman line is still a great choice, made even better by a centurion. The spear line is also helped out with more armor, and I'd give them an A as a very strong infantry sieve, only held out of the top tier by the fact that so little is happening for infantry passively. If you're slow to get upgrades, they can actually get overshadowed by civs like Japanese or Goths, in my opinion. Moving on to cavalry, I actually think Romans function completely fine as a cavalry civilization. You have a strong start into scouts or knights with bloodlines, leading into fully upgraded cavaliers, adding in a unique tech, giving them faster creation and a charge attack. You also then have the centurion as an alternative if you need even more punch in the late game, and in a team setting, I'd actually lean toward Roman cavalry over infantry or archers to start. I might not call them top tier as they're missing Hazar and Paladin, but it's enough for a B, and cavalry can definitely play an important role in raiding and dealing with hand cannoneers or siege, which their infantry can otherwise struggle against. Speaking of which, next up for their siege, the bombard cannon would have been amazing to support your scorpions against onagers, but understandably Romans lack that unit. Other than that though, it's pretty good, including getting siege engineers. It's honestly amazing how many bonuses and techs it requires to make scorpions attractive, but Romans are probably the sieve best set up to use those. Overall, I'd say it's an A- for Siege. Moving on to the Navy, early game you get out to a pretty nice start with a good economy and passive armor boost on the galley line. Romans are missing the demo line entirely as part of their no gunpowder rule, but early game I still like it enough for a B, with enemy fire galleys being the obvious threat. Late game they're then missing dry dock for some extra ship speed as well as importantly bracer on their galleon. Between having plus two attack from a unique tech and the extra versatile Droman, I don't think they're sunk, and it's another good but not great B in the late game for a B on water overall. 
Taking a quick look now at the monks, Romans are fairly unusual for missing the extra HP from Sanctity, though they still have the essentials, with Redemption and Block Printing as the two I look for first. Monks actually have a few helpful roles here, against particularly knights, which can otherwise run around Roman infantry, or as a response to onagers, which are a constant threat to scorpions. I'd say it's a B plus, and keep them in the back of your mind as a less obvious but definitely useful unit to mix in. Next up for defenses, unlike Romans in AoE 1, towers aren't really a specialty here, missing heated shot, arrow slits, and bombard tower. You're also missing hoardings and treadmill crane, so while they do build and repair faster by default, a sieve with all upgrades can actually end up as better constructors. Personally, I think Romans are better played aggressively, with men-at-arms or cavalry to keep the pressure on your opponent, and castle dropping to keep piling it on, so altogether I give Romans just a B for defenses. And finally, wrapping up with trash units, while the legionary or scorpion can be very cost-effective answers to trash units, and are pretty light on gold, if we restrict things to just the goldless units, Romans have some pretty obvious gaps, lacking bracer for skirmishers and the hazar. The halberdier does have plus one melee armor compared to usual, but this isn't really the Roman strength, though it's not terrible either, and I'd say it's a B-. So to give some closing thoughts, between requiring their own DLC and pushing some generally off meta units, I definitely understand Roman's lower play rate, but in my opinion they're still a bit of a hidden gem at the moment, with two totally viable game plans depending on your preference. The first is to take the 5% faster villager work rate and run with them as a cavalry civilization, going scouts and knights in a very standard way, with that solid eco bonus behind it, incorporating other Roman specialties if needed. Archers or skirmishers can also work early on as well, but require transitioning away to something else, as you're on a bit of a timer for those things to fall off a cliff. The other way to approach Romans is on their own terms as a premier infantry civ, fully embracing the men-at-arms and longsword play on the back of your economy, plus their better armor. Combined with either siege or counter units, that seems to be how the devs envision Romans being played. On maps like Arena, Hideout, or Enclosed, where your infantry's lack of mobility is harder to exploit and castle drops are more crushing, I think it really pays to lean into their unique identity, with those being among their best maps online. Basically, you can play it safe with the usual cavalry meta and that old rodeo, or get a bit wild and go down the infantry and scorpion route. If that kind of free-thinking wildcard attitude sounds like you, why not stop by for a howdy-do at my newest startup side business, Spirit of the Outlaw, a one-of-a-kind old-timey saloon. It even has a great website thanks to this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Where websites traditionally take a lot of technical knowledge to set up and maintain, Squarespace is a tool to help you create a professional looking site within minutes. If you're a blogger, own a small business, or chasing the passive income dream of opening an online store, but have no idea how to make a functional website from scratch, Squarespace has you covered with templates and tools to help you out, simplifying the website building process. Squarespace even has great third-party extensions to handle things like inventory, taxes, shipping, and scheduling to accommodate your specific needs. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash spirit of the law to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So that's a look at the Romans, and with that, this overview series is finally caught up again, though there's definitely some old overviews I'd still like to revisit and update. That'll do it for this one though. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.